and so when you directed Oliver and Company, did you were you able to animate that, or is, it, is that one of the things where you have, you felt like okay, I have to put aside being an animator so that I can direct this? Yeah, I, I wasn't animating at that point. You're directing. I started to say you direct the voice talent first because the animator puts headphones on, listens to that dialogue, and that inspires that animator. I'm sure, some of you animated you get this. That's all you have to go on, and so. I would direct the voice talent, say a Billy Joel line, bring that animator in, we could cast that animator. I would act it out again, and sometimes we would actually bring the voice talent, I mean, I'm sorry, the animator who's gonna do it, that particular character, to the voice session, so they can watch the actor. And they'll sit there and sketch, because they start to get really inspired by certain mannerisms. Billy Joel used his hands a lot. He had this kind of weird cocktail head to like deliver these lines. We got that into the character of Dodger. It's just, you know, and even on Lion King early on, Mufasa, James Earl Jones, early sessions with him, that animator was there. You know, like just sitting on the side, just drawing and drawing and drawing, doing real quick poses, very, very quick poses, just like little mannerisms of that actor that you then got into the, uh, into the performance of the, of the animation. So as a director, you're directing the voice talent and the animator and then seeing it through the end. So you're not animating. Was it hard to let go of that? Be like, okay, it's just a different kind no. of artistic expression. No, not at all. No, not it's pretty all. fun being a director. No, it was really can, fun being a director. Yeah, okay. I'm a better director than an animator. At some point, you just have to realize you just are better at some things and let go of other things because there's just better people than you are. And by the way, I was talking to somebody. I'm sorry. One of the producers. Thank you. Hire good people. Yeah, you should, you should, Murray. Yeah, Murray. you should be the dumbest person in the room. Yeah. You should. You should get really good people, get better people. There are scenes of animation that I'm looking at now for Shanghai. We're doing some scenes for one of the castles. I'm sorry, I can't go into more detail, but we're doing it. I'm ill-equipped Ill -equipped to really give the correct note. I reach out to one of the five you know, best animators in the business of feature animation for notes. What would you do with this? There's something wrong with it, but I can't put my finger on it. And he nails it. Uh, that's actually, there's a, a question from the audience, uh, from Max. Um, did you get the opportunity to, to meet uh, Glenn, Glenn Keane? Or, so Glenn Keane's a very famous animator at Disney. Ollie Johnson, that's one of the uh, original nine men. You may have heard about them, kind of a famous pack of animators. And what was it like working with them? Uh, yeah, and projects in general. So By the question. time... My generation of animators started working at the studio, the nine all men. These were men who had worked under Walt, or Kimball, or Lounsbury, Frank Thomas, Ollie. They had pretty much retired. One or two of the animators stayed and mentored. He was very helpful to the animators. Sorry, the name escapes me. However, there were such strong animators. Again, one of the appeals to your earlier question of working at Disney was, you're surrounded by better people than you, so it's only going to make you better. And I wanted to learn. I, I prefer working with people who are better than me because I'm just going to get better in, in the process. By that time, the group of animators who are really superb now were starting out, and I learned a lot from these people. I think, again, I think if you're reasonably open-minded about life and who you're working with, you learn from every situation you're in. I learn from teaching painting classes today from people who've never painted. There's a woman here sitting in the back, she's never painted, and I'm looking at her paintings going, wow, I never thought of it doing it that way. That's a really cool way of doing it. I think if you're kind of an open human being, these things come naturally to you. You've got, you have to force yourself to stay open. So you directed, a, oh, a, so let's uh, take a question from uh, Kim Murray, who's a local producer. She's been a huge help and a good friend, but a huge help as well. And had the great quote about working with other people. Yes. <laughs> Hi, George. Um, eight years ago, I remember touring MGM, and there's a building there with all the storyboard work from all the animated movies. And I remember them telling me that the artwork there was the very last movie that they were ever going to make completely with hand-drawn animators. And I remember feeling very sad. It felt like something was being lost 
And I was just wondering how that transition went for the actual animators and the artists, if they felt like something was lost as well, making the switch to CGI and, and you know, computer animation, or if they just been kept so busy that they didn't even realize there you know, was a transition. How all of that went? Because to me, it, it felt like something, as much as I love CGI and, and Brave is gorgeous, to me it still felt like there was an element that was just missing. So I was wondering how that went for that artist. That's a good question. There aren't two schools of thought. I know animators who are more my age who have decided that they don't want to learn the computer. That's, that's, they didn't get into the business. They didn't get into animation. Their love and passion was drawing. Was sitting with a pencil and a tactile feeling of drawing on paper was fundamental to them. And that's the choice they made. Others were willing to switch over to computers or work on large Wacom tablets. It, it's, it sort of depends on who you ask. I, but I find younger animators, people who are not coming out of school or in their 30s and stuff, that's not an issue. And personally, I think the performance speaks for itself. Either it's hand-drawn or it's done digitally. There's either a sincerity and a love for the work that's evident in traditional or it's going to be CG, but it's going to be there. It's going to, it's going to come through. So, but I know there's a lot of animators in my age who do, do not feel that way. Felt that we lost something fundamental. I, I respect it. I'm not sure I agree, but I respect it. And then, oh, it's a good question. Oliver and Company has, was one of the first animated films to have CG elements? Yeah. Was the, yeah. Great Mouse talking. Detective was a movie before this. It was Sherlock Holmes set in London. It was the first time we had started to use um, digital, the digital tools. There's a chase at the end of it through the, I think the Tower of London. And then Oliver and Company expanded on it. This was coming a long time ago. The, for those, of, myself included, I just, I could see the writing on the wall that the tool was gonna just get better and better and better, starting with the early Pixar work, Wally B, that John directed at Pixar. We were blown away by it. You, it didn't take much imagination to extrapolate forward and go, this is an amazing rapidograph. This is an amazing pencil in the hands of someone who cares. Not, not in the hands of an animator who's just going to sit there and let the, the computer do all the in-betweens and it's just going to drift around and it's gonna, the time is really going to be uninteresting. But in the hands of someone who has a passion for it, the tool is remarkable, remarkable. Sorry, did that? 